Welcome back to a new year of the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from neuroscientists across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of our members here. Each seminar focuses on one of the new interdisciplinary themes of Cambridge Neuroscience, which we will be launching later this year. For more info on the talks covered in this seminar series and all things neuro related here in Cambridge, please follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. So thank you very much, everyone for coming. Welcome back to the new term. Um, I'm sure you'll agree we have a very exciting lineup of speakers for this first half of the year, um, kicked off brilliantly by Professor Sarah Baker. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome Sarah. She's a friend and a colleague. Um, she's a professor of developmental psychology and education at the Faculty of Education here at the university. Her research aims to improve children's lives by identifying factors at home and school that can support their agency um, that they have over their own learning. And today she's going to share her research on identifying effective interventions in early childhood education. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Sarah and looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Derv, and thank you everyone for being here. I think this is going to be fun because we have the opportunity to have an interdisciplinary conversation. Um, I'm, I'm well aware that not everybody who's here will have a background in education or even necessarily in psychology, uh, but hopefully that won't be an impediment to our, our discussion later on. I'm, I'm actually happy to take questions either as we go or at the end or however you normally do it is fine. Um, so normally, Sarah, we take them at the end, but I mean, it's fine. completely up to you. If you don't mind people interrupting you, they can put up a hand or whatever, if that's what you prefer. Well, uh, I don't mind. Let's 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 try to do it at the end, then, shall we? Um, now, I realized this afternoon that um, I would like to change my title. So it's the title that is advertised, but in fact, I hope to show you um, as I'm talking that it's not quite right to say that what we're doing is identifying effective interventions. In fact, we're identifying effective practices. And so Throughout um, the rest of this talk, I'm, I'm going to tell you about the methodology we're using in this new project. And by the end of it, maybe you'll appreciate the difference um, between identifying interventions and identifying practices. It's actually really um, important. So this work is a collaboration between um, some of us at the Pedal Research Center at the Faculty of Education in Cambridge and some colleagues at the Early Intervention Foundation, which is based in London. EIF, for those of you who don't know, is a government um, set up by the UK government, funded by them originally, to um, act as a kind of clearinghouse for effective um, practices in the early years. And so we have this collaboration, and I'd like to present the work today. This will be the first time I present it too, so I'm really interested in hearing what kind of questions come up. First of all, I will make a case for why we think it's important to identify common elements of practice. Then I'll share the methods um, that we've used in this project uh, to, to do that. And finally, I'll talk about the communications strategy. The work is funded by the Nuffield Foundation and we're really excited that unlike a lot of um, other research grants, we actually have a substantial amount of time funded within the project because of the nature of the work and the aims of the Nuffield Foundation to be able to uh, communicate the findings. So that will be um, the, the last part of the talk. So first of all, why is innovation needed in early childhood education? We know from a lot of research over the years, including um, this quite um, classic study now by Kathy Silva and colleagues at Oxford that uh, early education, particularly in, in, you know, in the preschool years, really does um, make a difference for children, particularly for those who start off with less advantage. Um, but, you know, 
some quite obvious questions fall out of what seems to be now just received wisdom. What is girl, what, what is uh, good um, quality early education? And that deserves an evidence based answer. And also if we, if we could answer that question and we did know what was good practice, then how do we embed those practices at scale? So we're really thinking all the way from, um, you know, basic developmental psychology and the processes and the skills we want to develop in children, all the way through to, um, you know, the workforce and, and what happens in real life. Um, so this is important because there's a lot of money at stake potentially in, in answering the question of what good quality um, early education looks like. For example, in the UK, um, the current policy context is that the Sutton Trust, who some of you may be familiar with, um, they're quite an influential um, charity interested in education and, and fair you know, um, chances in life, they're currently running a campaign for the government to consider redistributing how the um, early years funding works. So some of you with young children will be intimately familiar <laughs> with the funding available. Um, but for those who aren't, it's possible for parents uh, within certain income brackets to claim money back from the government for sending their children to to early childhood um, settings. And because that is government money, that is taxpayer money, there's a valid question to be asked, you know, who should be, uh, first of all, who should be getting that support to send their children to, to, to these settings, but also, you know, um, what can we do to make sure that what's happening in those settings really is of high quality. So lots and lots of people are affected, lots of money is at stake. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, and so thinking again about this audience, I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, where we're situated in that kind of pipeline between um, the, the basic science and identifying those really specific elements of, of uh, and mechanisms in psychology and the skills that we want to develop in children, and then all the way to the kind of more complex picture of what's happening in a classroom. And the challenge is you may have um, some specific experiments, say from experimental psychology and developmental psychology that tell you um, about mechanisms, or you may even have experiments that tell you how you can, um, you know, intervene on those mechanisms and change the way those processes work. But applying those in a classroom setting is a very different matter. On the other hand, you may have, um, you know, whole scale programs. I mean, I'm sure many of you have heard of things like Montessori and these kind of pedagogical approaches, but they're extremely complex and knowing exactly which part of those is having an effect on children's development is very, is very difficult and challenging. So what, um, what we're aiming to do here is to come into this spectrum somewhere along the line and identify practices that are effective, but that have been used and are used in the real world in, um, in classroom settings. So I'll tell you how that works in a minute. But before I do that, I just wanted to share a little bit of the background with this, this um, method, the common elements approach. Uh, and I just picked, you know, some examples here um, that that have used, you know, that have published research using the common common elements method in other areas that may be of interest to this audience. For example, in um, in mental health and in um, you know, actually, other in other in some classroom environments such as student teacher relationship, there's been research on that. Um, and so on and so forth. So you can skim these, you can do your own literature, but it was just to show you that the common elements approach um, has been used in a variety of different areas, including you know, social work and clinical um, service provision, et cetera. We aren't aware of any research using this common elements methodology in early childhood education. So that's, um, that's where we hope to make a contribution. Now, what does this consist in? Because I'm saying common elements, common elements, common elements. But what exactly does it mean and how does it work? Okay, so in the early childhood education setting, you have a number of programs um, that are published manuals. And just like, you know, say in the, in the clinical field, I'm sure you can purchase these manuals if you have tens of thousands of pounds, sometimes less, but often they are quite expensive to purchase. Um, they're copyrighted, et cetera. 
And each one of those programs will have its own, you know, target area of skills that it's, it's aiming to develop. And uh, quite often, but not always, it will also have associated randomized controlled trials that have shown that it's effective. So an example uh, is the Nuff Field Early Language Intervention, Nelly. It's been in the news in this country recently because um, the this country's government, the Department for Education, have decided to invest heavily in this program, given that it has been shown to be effective. And they're really trying to get this program embedded in um, in, in early education. So that's that's one example of a program. There are others, some of you who work in executive functions uh, in, in, in childhood, uh, in psychology, for example, will be familiar with Tools of the Mind. That's a very kind of famous program at this point. A number of RCTs and actually some controversial findings there. But anyway, so there's there's all kinds of programs out there. And our aim in this project is to identify the programs that have RCTs that have shown that they're effective programs for supporting a number of skills, and we'll come on to which skills exactly in a minute, to get those programs, to buy the manuals, to obtain the manuals, in some cases they were just given to us, which was lovely, and to turn all of that information that's currently sitting within manuals into a library where practitioners could go and look up and say, if I'm interested in developing a certain aspect of literacy or a certain aspect of social emotional skills or executive functions, then I could go to this virtual shelf and pick out the practices that I know have been um, deemed to be effective. That's the principle of it. It sounds so simple that you might be thinking, I can't believe this doesn't already exist, <laughs> but it doesn't. Um, so we, um, have funding for this project in three steps. First of all, to identify which programs those might be. And that's not just based on intuition or our team's familiarity. Um, it was through a systematic uh, search of the literature for evidence-based programs and to get those programs. So that's the first step. Once we had them, we could code them. And then based on all of this extensive coding, as you can imagine, a lot of spreadsheets, we can create a library of those individual practices that have been identified as being common across the programs. So the first step was to decide what skills we um, thought should be considered. And this is, if you will, a coding framework. We have developed you know, um, more detail and definitions and examples, et cetera, behind this. But this summarizes the skills framework that we coded for and that we were interested in finding programs that related to. So it's, it's meant to be essentially comprehensive across development. Some of you might be thinking, oh, there are things missing. One of the big ones that we know is missing is motor skills, early motor skills, and we are aware of that. We deliberately put that aside. Um, we can talk about that if anybody's specifically interested in that. But other than that, this covers essentially all of the, the kind of primary areas um, of development, some more academic and some more kind of broad-based skills. Now, once we had set the skills framework, we could conduct a systematic review of the literature. Um, and as I said, we were looking for any program that supports those skills and that targets young children. These were our search terms. And then the criteria for inclusion were that we had to um, be able to get the manual. It had to be for our age range, which was two to five, delivered in an early childhood setting, et cetera. So you can see all of our inclusion criteria here. We were specifically interested in programs that had at least two RCTs that showed the program was effective. Now, that turned out to be one of the harder uh, criteria to meet. But nevertheless, we identified 348 programs and then we retained um, a number, as you can see, through, through each of the different areas that we were interested in. Um, some of them fell out because it ended up not being exactly the right age range or you know, for other reasons. So we got the manuals and here's a list for anyone who, who is familiar with early childhood programs. You might um, recognize a few of these. 
I've already mentioned Nelly and Tools of the Mind. Those are some of the more kind of famous ones. So having this list of, I think I said 27 programs to code, each one being somewhere between, I don't know, dozens and hundreds of lessons long, we had to go through. So the research team went through literally line by line, every one of the programs and coded these, the manuals, which gave us these big spreadsheets, right? So in all of the manuals we were coding for, for each of these things, the most um, kind of substantively interesting ones were the last two on the list here, the, the domain code, the main domain and the subdomain, which are the skills we're interested in. And then we also were interested in um, the practice description. So what was it that was happening? And that, that we'll come on to that. That's what gives us the common elements. Okay, so, so far so good, hopefully, it's clear um, how we conducted that first phase. It was about identifying effective programs and then um, kind of breaking them all down into all of their component pieces. And you can guess based on the name common elements, what happens next. You then look across all of these tiny, 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 tiny pieces and fragments that you've broken it all up into. And you search for what they have in common which things are coming up frequently over and over and over again. So you're kind of looking for patterns, basically. Just a reminder of the skills framework. I won't be able to show you today a complete set of findings. So I'm going to pick a few examples um, of our preliminary findings based on our coding, just to illustrate. It's more of an illustration, really, because I know the audience here is probably more interested in the method um, than, than necessarily the the kind of specific findings, but I will illustrate them. Mostly, in fact, I think all of my examples are from the social emotional skills domain. First of all, what you can do with this method is just have a really like a broad look across manuals. This is just a short list of, of the manuals. Um, this isn't all of them, but just to show you that you can, for example, ask whether, um, you know, how, how widespread certain skills are across the manuals. So just an illustration, right? Um, what you can see here is that most of the manuals tend to target many, many skills and um, you know, across the board in, in social emotional skills, they're mostly all targeting self-regulation, social cognition and social competence. One exception to that was the last one, red light, purple light on our list. Uh, which was only, um, in terms of our coding, only showed that it was targeting one of those and not, not all of them. But that's, okay, so that's just the really broad sweep there. First of all, you can see across the different areas. What you can then do is start to look um, in more detail. And I'm going to show you two approaches that we have been taking in parallel. One is a quantitative approach and one is a qualitative approach. So for those of you who, only um, do quantitative work, this might be a nice illustration of where the qualitative analysis can, can be um, a good complement. Let's just look at emotional knowledge, just so I can talk you through what you're looking at, just to give you the example here. So again, on the left is going to be all of the different skills in social emotional um, development, but just focusing on emotional knowledge, what you can see here is, our findings in terms of the different instructional methods that were coded across all of our manuals, any time that emotional knowledge specifically was being supported within a lesson, which methods were being used, okay? And the same for all of the different skills. But what you see here, for instance, in terms of this um, heat map, these are just percentages, is that, 25% uh, of the time, emotional knowledge was being supported through visual display materials or tools embedded in the class environment. It was very infrequent, in contrast, for emotional knowledge to be supported through drawing or writing. Okay, and then, of course, you could just go through and, you know, um, do any other comparisons you wanted. By looking across all of the different skills in the social emotional um, domain, 
and, and then kind of ranking them, you can see that there's a set, of a set of instructional methods that are coming out as being most frequently used. And those are, I guess, those top three, maybe four, if you want to extend it to, to games and icebreakers. Um, but really, the, the most common one is use of some kind of visual display. Now, an example of that in emotional knowledge might be having um, faces that show, you know, say a happy face, a sad face, and this kind of thing, and using those on the wall or on a poster and having children identify what emotion does this character, you know, is this person showing, for example. Um, and visual display being quite common across all of them, but not necessarily for every single skill. So social communication, for instance, stands out and using visual displays to support and teach social communication seemed much less frequent. So this is just the kind of heat map you can get from doing all this coding across all the manuals. Um, you can also, of course, do some analyses in terms of um, what, uh, you know, so which of, given, given all of the instructional methods that one could use, which ones are being used more than you would expect by chance or less than you would expect by chance. So with um, chi-square tests, we showed just again, sticking with the emotional knowledge example, that strategy practice and books, poems, songs, and nursery rhymes were used less frequently than would be expected by chance. Okay, as I said, I'm just illustrating the map and not necessarily trying to give you like a detailed, comprehensive um, summary of all of the findings. But one of the, um, okay, so that's, that's all I had to show you for the quantitative analysis for now, but you can imagine perhaps in other areas where these kinds of um, uh, approaches might, might be useful. I want to move on to the qualitative analysis because so far, um, I hope you'll agree that if I just showed you something like this, you know, just knowing that, say, Q&A and discussion is used frequently to support emotional knowledge, um, that's theoretically interesting information, but if you were a practitioner, that doesn't necessarily give you ideas or examples of what you could do, you know, today in your class, you would have to spend a lot of time thinking, okay, so how, you know, coming up with, coming up with actual practices and examples. So the idea in, in um, thinking again about going from the research base to really embedding these practices and putting them in the hands of practitioners, the idea is to be more concrete and to give people more specific information about those, um, about those kind of theoretical categories like Q&A and discussion. And that's where the qualitative analysis comes in. So the team coded, and again, this will just be an example, but the team coded all of the information that we have from the manuals. Every single, um, usually there was more than one in a lesson, okay? So, so even within lessons, every single kind of separate let's say block of activity was described in the spreadsheet as, a, you know, we called it a practice description. So there was a, a brief description about what was going on. Um, our, our team of researchers then went through all of that, um, you know, narrative, qualitative information and synthesized that and kept condensing it down until they couldn't really go any further. So they found these themes and then, we could start to see those patterns, those common elements emerging. And this is kind of coming at the same data from a different angle than the quantitative analysis I showed you earlier. So here, I just picked out some examples. These four lines here show you four uh, common practices for developing emotional knowledge. Here it's called understanding on another's feelings, but that's emotional knowledge, that's the same thing. So these four uh, lines here show you um, the, the practices, actually. So, so now we're not just talking about a Q&A and discussion, which was the broader quantitative instructional method that had been identified earlier, right? Here it's um, much more specific. So um, ex emotion, expressions, 
right? Emotions are expressed through facial expressions or body posture, words and meanings of different feelings, describing own feelings and how someone else might be feeling and why. So each of those is slightly, a slightly different aspect of understanding emotions, that idea of emotion knowledge, that skill. And here are the counts of those common elements across the manuals. So this list is ordered in terms of the most common and going down and I chopped it off. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But what you can see, for instance, is that 117 times across the manuals that were coded, we found something that related to understanding that emotions are expressed through facial expressions and body posture. Now, my example earlier about using faces in a, po in a poster, that would be an instantiation of understanding that emotions are expressed on a face. That's one way that could be done, right? There's other ways too, of course. But anyway, so 117 times we had something of this nature. Um, 75 times there was a, a unit or a, a kind of activity that related to understanding how someone else might be feeling and why. Um, these are fun examples for those of you who do theory of mind research, if there are any in the room. <laughs> Um, but, to, you know, I, I think it's fun to think about that, like you're doing this research in um, kind of perhaps a more experimental or a lab based environment and then this is what it could look like in a classroom or in a, in a manual for early um, educators. Okay, so we have that information right from our qualitative analysis and the synthesis and thematic analysis and then you get to the stage where you've really boiled it down to what um, what that element, what that common element is. And we can say it's common because of the counts, but you also have to consider how many different manuals it appeared in. So remember right at the start, I showed you an example of a list, a short list of the sub, sub selection of manuals. And there was one manual in there that only dealt with one of those skills. Well, I mean, in theory, that manual could have, you know, 200 examples of building that particular skill set. And the other manuals, although we said, yes, it was present and it was coded for that manual, maybe it was only dealt with one or two times. So in this list, you might be looking at an element that has a very high count and appears many, 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 many times, but it turns out that it's all from one particular program, in which case you wouldn't really be able to say that's common. I mean, you could say it was common in that program, but it's not a common element across all of the different programs that have been shown to be effective. So it's by looking at a combination of the overall frequency of that element and how it's spread across all the manuals that you can, you know, be more confident in saying this is a common element of practice. I'm going to pause for a breath and I'm also going to remind you of my opening thought I shared with you about how I wanted to change my title because I had when Derv asked me for a title and I said, oh gosh, I gotta like quickly send a title. So I did, um, but only thinking about it afterwards today and I thought actually that's not right. It's not about identifying um, the interventions. It's about identifying the practices. So now hopefully you can see what I mean and why actually there's a huge difference between identifying the interventions and identifying the practices. Okay. So a bit of reflection on the method as a method, and uh, you know, this would be through the lens of our experiences in um, the early childhood education domain, but I, I, I'd be interested in hearing whether you think these would apply to other areas, for instance, in, in clinical work. Um, first of all, we are limited by the raw data that is available. And if, um, if all of the data that we're using to code, right, to develop these extensive spreadsheets and to look for frequencies and to do our qualitative analyses and all of these things, if all of that is based on published program manuals, which I've told you it is, then we have to be very conscious when we come to the end of all of this to think, right, okay, well, these are the common elements. These seem to be very, um, you know, frequent practices present in those effective um, interventions, but there may be other things that aren't present in, or that aren't um, visible because they're not in published manuals that we haven't uh, accounted for here. So it's just that, just keeping the awareness that it's not, 
we can't say at the end of all of this that this is the definitive set of effective practices in early childhood education because there could be things that aren't in manualized programs. Okay, I mean, one of, well, I'll come on to, okay, so, so that's related to the next point, which is about RCTs and replication issues. Only certain types of interventions will lend themselves to RCTs and therefore would even be eligible to be picked up in our systematic searches in the first place. That's kind of a related point. Um, and, and, and extending that point, there is this challenge that um, once an intervention has been shown to be effective, or if, if it's shown to be effective, then maybe people don't continue to put funding into testing it over and over and over and over again. You know, you may get one shot at demonstrating something's effective. Once it's been published, then you may not find another um, attempt at replication because, you know, of course, RCTs, especially in education, are complex and, and expensive. So that is something that we ran into. We found a number of programs that had one published RCT and not more than one. But of course, that has to limit your confidence a little bit. And furthermore, what we didn't take into account is any um, known failures to replicate. So our criteria was actually just that there was evidence that it was effective, not that there was also no evidence that it was not effective. And for those of you familiar with tools of the mind and executive functions development, that's actually quite a contentious topic. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, again, it's the limitation of the kind of input into this approach. We are very fortunate to have a research team with a broad skill set. So I don't think it would be possible to undertake this kind of work unless we had practitioners working in our team. And we've been lucky to have, um, uh, well, most recently we've had a childminder who works as a research assistant with us, which is incredibly powerful and brings a lot of insight because it's not just about judging the frequency of the elements that we're finding, it's also about their plausibility and their feasibility and the judgments of, um, you know, so our age range is two to five. Anyone here who works with young children knows that that's actually a vast, <laughs> a vast, vast, vast um, continent from the ages of two to five. And so when we come up with skills and practice examples and common elements, we have to then ask ourselves, you know, do, is that feasible for a two-year-old? Is that feasible for a five-year-old? Is Can we adapt the example to be something that works you know, that's less challenging or more challenging for, for different ages within our age range. So there's a whole lot of actual practitioner expertise that also has to go into this. Um, a couple of more things that we're playing, playing with at the moment, as I said, this is, this is um, the first talk I'm giving on this um, in this kind of broader audience. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts too, but an, an objection that we've had is, don't we already know all of, don't we already know what good practice is? And so why do we need to do this? <laughs> and we have that objection from um, a, a couple of, you know, very senior colleagues. And the thing is like, you know, not everyone who's working in the field knows exactly what they should do if they um, are struggling with a child who, you know, is struggling to make friends, for instance. And if there was somewhere, you know, maybe they could figure that out and maybe they could go and do some reading or they could talk to colleagues who are more experienced than themselves. But if you're working, you know, with children in the moment and you would like to have a place where you could just go and look it up, then although the information is available out there somewhere and do we already know this? Yes, some people do, <laughs> but the idea is really about making sure that this is embedded and, and um, available at scale. Finally, something that is quite, quite an interesting challenge is how we link our skills framework, which I've showed you, you know, with like um, emerging academic skills, executive functions, social emotional skills, language and literacy, or lit language and communication. Um, how do we link that with the statutory guidance that's in place that practitioners are already using? And I suppose in the clinical world, there'll be similar statutory frameworks for practice. And then we come along from a kind of research developmental psychology side and say, well, here's a skills framework that we think is comprehensive. And they're at the same time <laughs> having to show and demonstrate uh, that they're meeting another set of skills targets. Um, 
that can be that can be challenging. So we have to think about how those two marry up. The reason that we didn't from the start design this to fit slickly into the existing statutory guidance is that we're hoping um, the early years library has a broader reach than just um, England, you know, or, or even just the UK. And so it didn't seem the right uh, strategy to simply align with that statutory framework. But it's a challenge that's there and it's a question we get asked. Okay, I said I was gonna talk about our communication strategy a little bit. I've got a few things to share with you. Um, of course, we have a Twitter account. So please feel free to look us up. Um, the common elements approach and the method, that would be a very um, kind of research based way of talking about it. When we talk about it to a wider audience, we're talking about the early years library. So that's the outcome of, of identifying all of these common elements. And we are advised by a panel of experts, around 15 practitioners from across the UK in different locations, different career stages, et cetera. And they're helping us understand how this might be used. So for example, nursery managers are advising us and saying, well, we could use it in a supervision setting with um, a new member of staff. And then, you know, that helps us think about that kind of in the moment um, training. We also have, of course, an advisory board for the project and they're comprised, the, the board is comprised of people from different backgrounds. Um, this is good because we get those challenges like, don't we already know this? <laughs> um, but we also have connections with policymakers, Department for Education and so on, who, um, who can help us think at this kind of early stage of the pipeline, how this might de be developed and where it might go. Most importantly, I think, is the needs of the early childhood education sector. It's been under particular pressure, especially with um, the pandemic. And some of you may have seen in the, in the news that um, you know surveys are showing a lot of early childhood education settings are under threat of closure because of staffing issues and um, most of the training that takes place for practitioners in the sector is in the workplace. There are um, there are some qualifications, you know, that are that are kind of a minimum, but a lot of people working in the settings are apprentices and people who don't have qualifications. We also know from reports from the um, Education Policy Institute that there's a lot of uh, kind of a revolving door in the sector. So a lot of people will go and work in early childhood education and then go work in retail and in hospitality and then come back to early childhood education and so on. So you really have a very specific workforce that you're trying to cater to. And when we talk about embedding practices, it's, it, you know, 450,000 workers, people who don't all have the same kind of um, qualifications. And the need is primarily for that in the moment access to these um, to this information. So based on that, oh, skills framework again, I guess that might be one of my favorite things. Um, as a developmental psychologist, of course, I'm obsessed with the skills. Here's an example. Okay, this is an, a, a preview, early view of what we're hoping will come out of all of this. And again, um, from the social emotional domain, this time it's uh, developing positive relationships. It's not the emotional knowledge one, but it's it's another, it's, you know, it's one skill, okay? So developing positive relationships would be the skill that somebody might be trying to support a child with. Like I said earlier, maybe they're uh, working with a kid and they're really noticing the kid's struggling to make friends. So what they could do is they could look this up. Here we have four um, common elements that we've identified. And those are the ones, those are the columns. And under each of those elements, we will offer examples, there's more concrete practices. So if we just gave them the common element, as I was saying earlier, that remains a little bit abstract and a little bit academic, but by giving practice examples, you're saying, here are some things you can try out. And then of course you would hope, uh, and, and it's always the case that people who work in early childhood settings are very creative. So they would then maybe try this one day and then the next day adapt it and try something else. And so you're really kind of just giving them that boost and that, that inspiration essentially. I think I'm nearly to the end because we want to leave time for some questions, but I hope you have seen, you know, we can go all the way from a systematic review of the, of the whole field to something very concrete here. 
that will be useful to practitioners. Our next steps are, we're on the verge of launching the guidance, the, the library, I should say, for um, each of these different uh, domains, and that'll be between now and June. We will, of course, publish our systematic review of the programs themselves in an academic um, uh, outlet. We are in talks already with a funder who might be able to support us in developing the library as an app, because of course that's what everyone wants. It's just like click, 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 tap, 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 and, and get your information. Um, and then finally, the big, big, big caveat to all of this is that we've taken programs that have been shown holistically to be effective and picked out practices. What, what we then have to do ideally it would be then to go back and test whether looking at those in isolation or look or um, having people use the library, which is a set of distinct practices, whether that is effective for supporting um, children's development. It remains me to thank the entire research team of people both at EIF and at PEDAL, at least one of whom is here today, so that's exciting. <laughs> Feel free to chip in or add or correct anything that I might have said that um, you think deserves comment. And thanks to our funders as well, the Nuffield Foundation. Thank you, Sarah, for that really enlightening talk. Join us next week when we welcome Associate Professor Mariana Bozic. Mariana is an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cambridge and a Fellow and Director of Studies for Psychological and Behavioural Sciences at King's College. Her research aims to understand the cognitive and neural mechanisms that underpin language comprehension, to explore how these mechanisms may have evolved and to understand how our brains adapt to the requirements of learning and using more than one language. She will be telling us how bilingualism modulates the neural mechanisms of selective attention. For more info on this seminar series and all things neuro related here in Cambridge, follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. See you next time.